All right, folks, so let's talk Measure for Measure Act 3. Okay, so let's start off with Act 3. What's the recap? What happened here? Well, Claudio and Isabella in scene 1 uh, talk about Angela's proposition. The Duke, who's dressed up as a friar still, remember, don't forget that, tells Isabella about Mariana, and they hatch a plan to save Villa Isabella's soul. And then we have Act 3, Scene 2. Here, it's the Duke meets Lucio again, who also puts his foot in his mouth again. Um, then the Duke, still dressed as a friar, asks Aeschylus what he thinks of the Duke. Okay, um, so let's sort of break this down. As far as Act 3, Scene 1 goes, there's a couple of questions that I kind of want to talk about here. Um, the first one being, Claudio seems to be speaking as if he is noble at the beginning of his discussion with Isabella. Does he remain noble throughout this discussion? How does Isabella feel about Claudio's reaction? Do Claudio's reactions change when he speaks to the Duke, who's still dressed as a friar? Um, who is Mariana? And how does the Duke suggest that Mariana can solve Isabella's problem? So let's break this down. Well, at the beginning, when Claudio is speaking with Isabella, at first, he seems incredulous. He seems like he can't believe that Angelo is such an awful human being uh, that he would proposition Isabella to uh, have her basically trade her body for Claudio's life. Uh, he actually says, oh, heavens, it cannot be, right? Um, and then he tells her, thou shalt not do it, right? Don't do this. This is not something you need to do. I don't expect you to do it. And then he starts to think about it a little bit. He's thinking, oh, wow, this is awful. I'm going to look at all these things that I'm going to be missing, right? And, you know, the doubt starts to creep in. He gets a little bit fearful of death, maybe. He starts to mourn his loss of life. He tells her, Death is a fearful thing. And at this point, Isabella's like, oh no, it's going to happen, right? Uh, you can kind of feel it. So after he muses a little bit more uh, in Acts 3, scene 1, lines 133 to 47, he begs Isabella. He says, sweet sister, let me live. What sin you do to save a brother's life, nature dispenses with the deed so far that it becomes a virtue. What kind of BS is that? honestly, right? He's trying to twist it around to make it something that is going to be valuable to Isabella's soul when she's just worried about this soul of hers. She wants to be a nun. She doesn't want to go and, um, you know, possibly uh, get pregnant with a child by Angelo and then be in the same situation as Claudio. Like, why would she want to do that? Um, but he asks her to. And, you know, Isabella gets a little cranky about this. I don't blame her. Do you blame her? Um, so let's see. So at first she is repulsed and disgusted. She tells him, oh, you beast, oh, faithless coward, oh, dishonest wretch. Wilt thou be made a man out of my vice? Right. So she's basically saying here, uh, I think the first part is pretty self-explanatory. But this, wilt thou be made a man out of my vice? Will you become whole again? Right? Will your life again be yours because of this sacrifice that I have to make? Okay, and, and, and I mean, that's a fair point, isn't it? And then she's incredulous. Might but my bending down reprieve thee from thy fate, it should proceed. I'll pray a thousand prayers for thy death, no word to save thee. Now, there's a little bit of play on words here with this might but my bending down, um, but She's saying, you know, basically, I'm not going to sleep with Angelo to let you live. That's not going to happen. If I could sacrifice my life for you, I would do that. But that's not the option here. Okay, so instead of doing this, instead of sacrificing my soul, I'm going to pray a thousand prayers for your death. Okay, I'm not going to save you. I'm just going to pray that you have a, uh, a successful death, that you go to heaven, okay? Um, and she kind of shows that she has moral high ground over all of Vienna, right? Because remember, everybody that we see has these sort of questionable sexual mores, um, everybody except for Aeschylus and the Duke, it seems, it seems. Uh, and she says, thy sin's not accidental, but a trade, mercy to thee would prove itself a bod. 
So thy sin, Claudio's sin, um, his the fact that he slept with Juliet before they were married is not an accident, right? It's something that he did, which then caused this justice to be dispensed upon him. And she says, mercy to thee would prove itself a bod. So giving him mercy here, giving him clemency, letting him free would end up just reinstigating the same type of behavior and reinforcing that it's okay. Okay. Um, so she's, she's just really, you know, Isabel is a smart cookie. Uh, she is definitely someone who's able to use her rationale and her reasoning and her language to prove a point here. And so, you know, she says all of these things to Claudio and then the Duke who's been in hiding, right? He finally comes in and he just hammers the last bit home. Okay, uh, he validates Isabella's story, says, hey, yeah, I know that Angelo did this awful thing um, and tells Claudio, you know what, dude, you're going to die. That's what happens. And then Claudio finally, now that he speaks to the Duke, uh, still dressed as a friar. Right. So he's thinking that the Duke is dispensing some sort of moral, um, you know, excellent moral advice here. He says, let me seek or let me ask my sister pardon. I am so out of love with life that I will sue to be rid of it. So he's saying, I'm just done. OK, I'm going to ask for Isabella. I'm going to tell her I'm sorry. And I'm just done with all of this lifing. OK, um, I'm, I give up. That's basically what he says once he talks to the Duke. So is this ironic timing? Yeah, it is. It definitely is. It shows that he respects the friar, friar's opinion more so than he respects Isabella's opinion. Um, it shows us a lot of things about Claudio's character, that he values a man's opinion over his sister's opinion. Um, you know, it just says a lot. So who is Mariana? And how does the Duke, still as a friar, suggest that Mariana can solve Isabella's problem? Well, the Duke tells Isabella uh, that Mariana is, um, she, should this Angelo have married, was a fiance to her oath and the nuptial appointed, between which time of the contract and limit of the solemnity, her brother Frederick was wrecked at sea, having in that perished vessel the dowry of her sister, uh, of his sister. Uh, lost a noble and re Mariana lost a noble and renowned brother, the portion and sinew of her fortune, her marriage dowry with both her combined husband, this well-seeming Angelo. Okay, there's a lot happening in here. Basically, the Duke is telling Isabella that Mario, uh, Mariana and Angelo should have gotten married. They were pre-contracted, just like Juliet and Claudio. Uh, so just sort of notice how that similarity is there. But uh, before they were able to get married, her brother, Frederick, who was a noted sailor and soldier, um, was wrecked at sea with her dowry, with the money that was going to be used to, uh, you know, to, to give to Angelo for marrying Mariana. OK, that might sound weird if it's not something you're, you're un if that's not something you're familiar with. Uh, but that's not super strange in terms of what's happening uh, in the 1600s. OK, uh, so now not only in this case did Mariana lose her brother, um, she lost her fortune and then she lost her husband because Angelo walked out. He said, I'm not going to get the money. Uh, no. And so now, you know, this well-seeming Angelo uh, is now known, at least in, in, in terms of people who know about this situation, to be less well-seeming, wouldn't you say? And so the Duke decides, I have this great plan. So he said, he tells Isabella, we shall advise this wronged ma maid to stay, uh, set up your appointment with Angelo. Go in your place. If the encounter acknowledge itself hereafter, it may compel her to her recompense. And here by this is your brother saved, your honor untainted, the poor Mariana advantaged and the corrupt deputy scaled. So he says, okay, I have this great plan. So if we do this thing, Technically, it's going to be okay, right? Because they're pre-contracted. And that she, Mariana, might get what she wants out of this because we know that she's still in love with Angelo. 
we see that the fact that Mariana is going to sleep with Angelo in Isabella's place might save Claudio's life because that was the trade, right? That was the deal. Um, Isabella gets to remain a virgin so she can go continue to be a nun and her soul is now safe. And then Angelo has to deal with the punishment for his crime. Everybody wins here. That's what the Duke is thinking. He's thinking, okay, my plan is brilliant. Everybody's going to win. Uh, Angelo is going to be outed as, you know, this sort of awful human being um, to the people that matter, right? We're not sure exactly how yet, but we know it's going to happen. Um, they are going to use uh, Mariana to get what she wants, but also to get what we want. And Isabella is going to be saved. Win-win. Okay. So then we move into Act 3, Scene 2. And, you know, there's a few things that happen in here. Lucio comes back in again. Uh, yet again, he does make himself look very stupid. Uh, and then Aeschylus uh, is talking to the Duke about the Duke. It's, it's a very interesting scene. Uh, and then the Duke has a monologue at the end of the scene. And the question that I pose is, well, what happens... Uh, in that monologue, and what does it tell us? So let's see how Lucio makes himself look stupid. Well, in this particular scene, he can't seem to figure out the Duke dressed as a friar's kind of angle, okay? And that could be because he's in disguise, right? So initially, when the when uh, Lucio is talking to the Duke, he praises Angelo's governing style. He says, Lord Angelo dukes it well in the Duke's absence. He puts transgression to it. So he's saying, Angelo's stamping out people doing these misdeeds, right? And so he's, he's praising him. But then when the Duke says, yeah, Angelo's doing a good job, you know, he says, they say this Angelo was not made by man and woman after this downright way of creation. Right? He's saying, Angelo's not quite human, right? So now Lucio has taken it kind of in a weird direction. You know, he's saying that Angelo is so moral uh, that he's just not quite human. He's got ice in his veins. He, um, you know, it, it, he he's just praising Angelo in all these over-the-top ways that are also really absurd. And then he becomes incredulous about Claudio's punishment. He says, why, what a ruthless thing is this in him for the rebellion of a codpiece to take away the life of a man. Well, what this essentially means is that what he does in bed, right, the rebellion of a codpiece is, um, you know, sort of what that essentially means is that he has acted upon the, uh, the impulses that he has um, to take away the life of a man, right? He does this action and then it totally changes everything. His entire life changes. Uh, he's going to be put to death. And how ridiculous is that? Um, he even starts talking about the Duke, saying that uh, his use was to put a ducat in her clack dish. The Duke has crotchets in him. He would be a drunk too. Let me inform you. He's just talking and he's just saying things, right? Are these things that, Lu that Lucio knows? Uh, no. Does Lucio pretend that he knows them? Yeah. He's basically saying, you know, the Duke is a big guy for vices. He has a lot of them. He likes women. He likes drinking. Oh my goodness. Let me tell you about the Duke, right? That is essentially what Lucio is doing here. And then he tells the, the Duke, right, who's still dressed up, so Lucio doesn't realize that it's him, that the Duke himself is a very superficial, ignorant, and unweighing fellow. So as the Duke is sitting here listening to all of this, you know, at first he's like, okay, I kind of thought Lucio was an idiot before. Uh, and then he's like, well, you know, I mean, he's praising Angelo, still an idiot, but, you know, he doesn't know that Angelo's doing this weird stuff. And then he's like, okay, so now he's criticizing Angelo when he was just praising him. And then now he's talking smack about me, the Duke, to me? How stupid is this guy, Right. Of course, Lucio couldn't possibly know that the Duke is who he is, right? Because he's dressed up as a friar. But, you know, it, it, it's interesting to watch Lucio's arguments change and then to watch him fall victim to his own need to constantly fill silence, right? That's essentially what traps him. So the Duke gets 
you know, a little bit offended and goes and talks to Aeschylus, right? He's still dressed as a friar. Aeschylus doesn't realize this is him. And remember, Aeschylus is the Duke's most trusted advisor. So how he doesn't recognize that the Duke is the Duke while he's dressed up, that's another story entirely. I We're just going to roll with it, okay? Um, and Aeschylus tells the Duke, above all other strifes, the Duke is contented especially to know himself. So he's saying, you know, the Duke just, he kind of keeps to his own, right? So he essentially, Aeschylus is basically telling the Duke as a friar that, the Duke is not the things that Lucio just said that he was. And this sort of validates how the Duke feels about himself. Uh, and then, you know, he, he keeps pressing a little bit, the Duke. And Aeschylus tells him that the Duke is a gentleman of all temperance, right? And this, again, uh, you know, works against what Lucio has said and validates the Duke's idea of himself. But you know, it's to Aeschylus's credit that he doesn't do what Lucio does and just keep on and on and on and on talking about uh, the Duke, right? He quickly shifts the topic back to Claudio. He's like, the matter at hand is Claudio. And so he talks to the Duke as the friar and is like, have you prepared him for death? Have you given him his last rites? Um, you know, and so we see that Aeschylus is that, that sort of wise leader that you know, the Duke needs to use for advice uh, that Angelo chooses to reject, right? He doesn't listen to what Aeschylus is saying, and Aeschylus isn't assertive enough to tell Angelo that he's being stupid because Aeschylus respects the roles that are provided for him, okay? So then we come to the Duke's monologue at the end of the scene. What does that tell the reader? Well, it, the Duke is reflecting on what he's learned as he observes what's going on around him. And so he reaffirms that mercy and justice go hand in hand. He says, we, meaning rulers, who hold the sword of heaven will bear, should be as holy as severe, pattern in himself to know, grace to stand, and virtue go. Right, he's saying, you know, we who are in charge need to use that power in a positive way. Okay, that's essentially it. He's saying life is not black and white. Life happens in the gray area, and we need to recognize that. And so we see that the Duke himself is, is gaining more wisdom here. Uh, he also recognizes that those in power, like Angelo, uh, are not above the law. He says, more nor less to others paying than by self-offenses weighing, shame to him whose cruel striking kills for faults of his own liking. Right? How dare Angelo try to kill Claudio for the same thing that Angelo is asking Isabella for. How dare he? Okay, he's saying no one is above the law. Everyone follows it. I can't, as a ruler, go out and kill someone for the same action that I am committing. And then we see that realization that Angelo is just not cutting it. He says, oh, what may man within him hide, though angel on the outward side? He's saying, wow, Angelo talked a good game here. He really did. He had me snowed, right? He seemed like a good man. He seemed temperate. He seemed wise. He seemed just. And you know what? He's none of those things, right? So we see self-reflection uh, in this. And then we also see the Duke telling the reader that Angelo and Mariana are going to be together and it'll right Angelo's past wrongdoings. When I say right his wrongdoings, I mean, you know, it will, it will make sure that justice comes down upon him. And he says, with Angelo tonight shall lie his old betrothed but despised. So disguise shall by the disguised pay with falsehood, false exacting and perform an old contracting. So he's saying, you know what? Mariana is going to sleep with Angelo tonight. He's not going to know. And this, this trick is going to um, bring to light this old marriage contract that they have. Uh, and it'll be under that marriage contract that this action is committed. 